and um, okay. So hello everybody. Um, we start our uh, QLS guest seminar webinar series. Um, I present to you Adrian Jacopo from uh, the Rockefeller University. Uh, I believe also Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute is involved in this uh, project that uh, Adrian develops. Uh, today, Adrian will tell us about uh, symmetry breaking during morphogenesis of a mechanosensory organ. Uh, this talk uh, may slightly overlap with the previous speaker, uh, Anna Erzberger, but I think uh, that the topic is very rich and uh, Adrian would uh, tell us about uh, very different things from what we heard in Anna's uh, talk. All right, Adrian, I invite you to proceed. Uh, okay. with your thank talk. you, Roman. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, being here um, virtually. Um, so yes, uh, there will be some overlap with what Anna told you. But um, uh, yeah, I'll try to. Um, so we, we try to agree with Anna so that there's no uh, so much overlap. And uh, hopefully, you can learn a few uh, new things. Um, so as you probably know, like at least some of you from um, uh, talking with Roman, um, we in the lab study um, mechanosensory epithelia, so the, the um, essentially the tissue that enables our senses of hearing and balance. And what I'm interested in, and I've always been interested in, is in, in pattern formation. And one of the reasons that I uh, joined this lab is because these mechanosensory epithelia are one of the most striking examples of patterns in nature um, and of self-organization. And what you're seeing here, this picture is um, the um, a, a picture of the apical surface. So it's the top of what is called the bullfrog sacculus. So this is a, an organ from a frog that uh, the frogs use to sense vibrations on, on the ground. And, and that way they can detect approaching predators, essentially. Um, so they, they sort of lay on the ground uh, with their what is would be the equivalent of their ears uh, touching the ground and then these organs pick up vibrations and they transmit these vibrations and uh, they transduce them into electrical impulses that are related to the brain and they do this thanks to this structure which is called the hair bundle and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how um, that is done but what I want to uh, to focus on um, in this picture is how remarkable these structures are so in this organ, first of all, so you have structures that are at multiple scales. So at the cellular scale, you have this structure called the hair bundle. So these are sort of very well reproducible from cell to cell and from animal to animal. And they're formed by these uh, sort of finger-like protrusions called stereocilia. Uh, and the variations in uh, length and number of stereocilia in, uh, from cell to cell are controlled within like 5 to 10%. Um, so this is a very well controlled process in which cells can form these structures and these patterns. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the patterns um, in a second um, with a lot of reproducibility in this environment that is very dominated by noise. So the cells, um, uh, the, the, the production of, of uh, proteins inside the cell is a stochastic process. It's very noisy. Um, there's uh, thermal noise. There's noise associated to the copy number of these proteins. But nevertheless, they are able to create these remarkable structures that are, that are sort of hundreds of nanometers in size. And they're, uh, in some sense, they're better than anything we can do with current technology. And the other thing that I want to, uh, the other two things that I want you to focus on is that um, these um, bundles are all oriented in the same direction. So they have this sort of high gradient um, that is always pointing in the same direction. And this is essential for their function because they are sensitive to, um, to movements, displacement of the surrounding fluid just in one direction and along one axis. Um, so they, they have this, so the organ has this sort of uh, long range polar uh, order where all the cells point in the same direction. And the other thing that I want you to focus on is how the cells are sort of um, spaced regularly forming these hexagonal patterns. So you see this cell at the center and has six cells um, on the sides and sort of these form this uh, uh, quasi hexagonal crystal that is um, that spans the whole organ okay um, 
So these uh, patterns occur at multiple scales, and these scales are coordinated, okay, with one another. The, so in particular, for example, the polarity uh, that is sort of long range has to coordinate inside each of the cells. It has to tell each of the cells which way they need to, to, uh, to point. So let me tell you a little bit more now about... Um, Adrian, I'm yes. sorry. Have you changed your slides or it's always the same? I changed the slide now. Is it stuck now? Um, it did not work. Okay. Let me... Can you yeah, re re restart? Yeah, your maybe. Uh, the second slide. So you're seeing the second slide now? No, Here in balance uh, and mechanism. Yes. So now, yes, now yeah. I so this see. is the second slide. Yeah, yes. now it works. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, as I was saying before, uh, these tissues and, and the organs that they um, that they form uh, are used for um, hearing balance and, and hearing imbalance. Okay, so this the the this organ um, that I showed you before is uh, shares a lot of similarities with the tissues in our inner ear. Uh, and in particular, what they share is that they're formed by the same type of cells. So these hair cells are also present in our inner ears, and they allow us to, so they allow you to hear what I'm saying now, and they also allow your semicircular canals, so these three uh, small organs here, to sense rotations of your head. Uh, so these are like, a, uh, essentially like gyroscopes, and they sense the, uh, like accelerometers, sorry, and they sense the rotations of your head like your phone does. Uh, and then there's the vestibular organs that sense uh, linear accelerations of the head. So if you are, for example, in an elevator with your eyes closed, you know that the elevator is uh, going up or down um, uh, just because uh, the, this, the, the, um, the vestibule gets activated and senses these linear accelerations. Or like if you're in a car or in a bus, uh, you sense the accelerations thanks to the utricle. And they do this, again, as I was saying, because um, these organs contain these hair cells. So this is a schematic of the um, of uh, one of the cells that I show in the previous slide. So this is a hair bundle, which corresponds to this green structure here. This sits on top of the whole cell that you don't see here because it's covered sort of by the epithelium doesn't let you uh, see what's um, below. And then um, if we zoom in into the hair bundle, uh, we see is that it's formed by these uh, actin protrusions called stereocilia, and these actin protrusions are connected to each other by these chains of proteins called tip links that are sort of like uh, springs, and these chains of proteins connect to um, uh, ion channels, and these ion channels open when the tip links are put into tension. So when there's shear motion, by, so there's deflection uh, created in the surrounding fluid, and this shear is created by, let's say, movement of the head or by sounds, uh, then uh, these uh, tip links, these chains of proteins are put into tension, the um, channels open, and then ions enter into the cell, the cell depolarizes and then relays through the, um, um, uh, the, so the neuronal connections relay this information to the brain. So this is the way that these cells transduce um, uh, uh, mechanical uh, movements into electrical signals. And just, uh, just to complete um, this slide, so it, this is a, a view, it's sort of a side view of this hair bundle, and this is a view of a similar cell where we remove all the stereocilia, so the, these um, uh, dots here represent, show where the, the stereocilia were anchored on the surface of the cell. And what you see is that they also form this hexagonal arrangement that is very precise. So the distances, the variation in distance between um, between two of these uh, locations is uh, within uh, one percent, and these are like these are like ten nanometers apart. So this is very very well controlled up to a nanometer in distance. Uh, and this is something I also work uh, on, and we collaborated with Roman also in a paper trying to understand how these patterns are formed and how is the noise uh, controlled. Well, so what are the limits in, uh, to the um, noise, uh, the, uh, the noise in the expression of proteins that would allow for um, such a precision to be um, achieved. But so this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we can discuss it later if, if anyone is interested. Um, so uh, just to make the, the point further, 
there is, these patterns are multiple levels. So you have the pattern at the subcellular scale that forms this hexagonal arrangement of the stereocilia and also this third case uh, that is also very well controlled. And then sort of at the cellular level, you have what I was uh, talking about before. So you have this long range or, um, order of cells that point in one direction or the opposite. And this makes the cells sensitive. For example, in this case, this is a, a human vestibule. So this is, um, um, it's a mouse vestibule. So this is, sorry, is um, these cells are sensitive to movements of the head towards sort of, uh, the, to for, uh, backward movements of the head, and these cells are uh, sensitive to forward movements of the head. Okay, and and so this is another example, which is the organ I'm going to talk about today. Um, this is in a in a fish, and you can also see how sort of this green, this black dot. So sorry, this is the other thing I, I need to explain. So this black dot uh, shows the position of this, so the tall end of the um, of the hair bundle. And this um, shows what is a, the um, direction of sensitivity, okay? So these black dots makes these cells sensitive from the left of your screen towards the right. And these, in this case, uh, these cells are sensitive in this direction. These cells are sensitive in the opposite direction um, and so on. And this is an organ that I'm going to talk about more. It's an organ in the fish that I'm going to talk about uh, more in detail. Um, and uh, the fish use this organ in a very similar way to detect um, uh, flow of water. Okay, and I'm going to tell you more in detail how it's done, but then let me move also to the tissue level. So this is the other thing I was mentioning before that like if you look at the whole tissue and this is a utricle in a mouse, so this is again an organ that the mouse used to detect linear accelerations of the head, the cells in red, which are the hair cells, are sort of in a, this pepper spray pattern and they're always uh, surrounded by these other so these green cells around them, which are um, the supporting cells, the so-called supporting cells, and this is also uh, reproduced in our co in the cochlea. This is a mouse cochlea again, but it's very similar to a human one, where you can see the cells sitting in this hexagonal pattern, and they're surrounded by these sort of black unlabeled cells that are the supporting cells, um, and this is always um, the case in this mechanosensory epithelia. So it's always you get this. Um, arrangements in which um, you get you never get two hair cells in contact with each other. They're always separated by a um, support cell. This is something also I, I worked on. Uh, I'm working on trying to understand how you get this uh, how you get this arrangement. But now let me focus on uh, the story I want to tell you today, which is um, this organization um, of this polarity reversal in the in the zebrafish. So again, so this is a a schematic of a two-day, three-day-old zebrafish, and these green dots form what is called the lateral line, which is formed by these organs called neuromas that the fish used to detect water currents. So these organs are right underneath the skin, so this is um, uh, sort of these uh, uh, pinkish uh, cells are the skin layer, and they have this very long kinocilia, so these uh, which are represented by these black dots, that stick out the um, uh, the skin of the fish and act as antennas, okay? So these peak vibrations, the vibrations get transmitted to the hair bundles, which are these uh, green structures here. And then the hair, bundle, uh, hair bundles get uh, deflected. And this is how the fish knows which direction the surrounding fluid is moving, okay? And they can use these organs to detect many things. So one is proprioception. So they can detect uh, the direction and the speed at which they're swimming. Uh, and they can also detect so uh, predators and prey in the surrounding water, okay? They can detect vortices in the surrounding water. They can detect flow if there's a predator trying to suck them in and eat them uh, and, and so on. And they do this because uh, this organ has two varieties of hair cells. So there's one uh, half that is pointing towards, that is sensitive of, to movement towards the tail of the fish, these cells here, and there's the other half cells that are uh, sensitive to movements towards the head of the fish, these cells um, here, okay? And so this is, an, this is a schematic, and this is sort of a, a real picture of uh, some of these cells uh, where you see three of them pointing towards the tail, three of them pointing towards the head. And so the, the thing that we want to understand is how is this arrangement achieved, okay? So this is a sort of a reduced version of what I told you before with this 
long range order. So in the in the newer mass, there's not that many cells. So the order is sort of local. And you get this sort of line that divides the cells pointing in one direction and the other. And we want to understand how this comes to be. Okay. And this organ is very robust. So you can kill all the cells and it will generate the same arrangement of cells over and over again. And you can kill a few cells and the new cells will always be um, sort of the, uh, having this ratio of 50 50 and the cells um, the new cells uh, facing each other uh, so the first thing we want to do uh, if we want to understand how this organ self organizes is just look at it and see what happens okay see where these cells come from okay so what you're seeing here is um, uh, a confocal picture so we're looking at the cells in the microscope um, and we have um, the uh, we have a genetic uh, genetically modified fish where the hair cells and only the hair cells so the their surrounding supporting cells here that you are not seeing express a protein that is green fluorescent so express this green fluorescent protein um, and we are looking at a focal plane so uh, that is sort of cutting uh, in the middle of the of the um, of the neural mass. So what you're seeing is sort of the nuclei of the cells and these very bright cells. And what you're gonna see now when I play the movie is that there is a stem-like cell here that makes a decision that it wants to become a hair cell. So it starts upregulating this uh, green fluorescent protein. So when it, it makes a decision, so all the um, uh, genetic uh, regulatory network that creates a hair cell gets activated and this activates this gene that produces a green fluorescent protein so it's becoming green there and now you see that the cell went on and divided so now there's two cells there's one there and one there and you see sort of the division between the two cells i hope you can see the video um, clearly and then these cells go on and do these rearrangements that is this is what uh, anna i think anna told you about um, uh, in her in her seminar Yes, yes. <laughs> so you're going to see uh, the cells sort of move and rearrange, and then they go their separate ways. And now what they're going to do is they're going to form this structure at the top, the hair bundle. So now we're going to move the focal plane up um, so that we can see this happening. And you're going to see the hair bundles of all the other cells that are already mature. And then you're going to see the hair bundles of these uh, newly formed cells sort of starting to form. They becoming you see now they're becoming sort of more prominent uh, because they're uh, collecting more of these green fluorescent protein. And initially they're unpolarized, but then they sort of, they break the symmetry and they form this polarized structure. And what you see is that these two bundles are facing each other, okay? So this whole process of division uh, starting from stem cell creates two cells which are oppositely polarized, okay? So the question now becomes, how do they coordinate these? So how does one cell know that it has to point towards the tail of the fish and the other cell know, okay, my sister is pointing towards the tail, so now I'm gonna point towards the head, okay? So, and this is um, what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit more about how the cells know essentially head from tail. Um, what is known is that they express a set of proteins, one of which uh, is this, set, this protein called Bangle 2, and these proteins form um, part of what is called the, the planar cell polarity pathway. So there's a bunch of cells that get polarized on the surface of the, of the cell in either one side or the other. Um, and these, um, in this case, for example, Bangle 2 is always polarized on the side that faces, so the posterior end, so the, the tail of the fish, okay? So this is how the cells know, have this global order that says, okay, okay, the tail is one side, the head is the other side, okay? But all the cells have the same pattern of expression of these proteins, okay? So this is not what makes a decision if they're gonna point away from this pattern of expression or in the same direction, okay? And it's uh, been shown recently that it, there is um, another protein called EMX2, which is a transcription factor. And with this protein is expressed, it's known that the cells face, so the, the bundle, the hair, the, the hair bundle or the, the kinocilium of the cells faces the same direction as bundle two. And when it's not expressed, it faces the opposite direction, okay? And we know, so the cells 
come in equal numbers of what I, I'm going to call them from now on coda, the ones that point towards the tail, and rostra, the ones that point towards the, the head. So there's equal numbers of coda and rostered cells. The coda cells always express EMX2, the rostered cells don't express EMX2. Okay. And we know that this is sort of a master switch because um, if we overexpress, so if we flood all the cells with EMX2, so we create a transgenic fish where all the cells express EMX2, then all of them point in the coda direction, all of them point towards the tail. And if we mutate the gene so that the protein is no longer present, uh, all of them point towards the head of the fish. Okay, uh, so this seems to be a necessary condition. So the presence of EMX2 needs, seems to be a necessary condition for the cells to be coded. And when it's not present, the cells are roster polarized. But this doesn't tell us much. So this only changes the question from a morphology question of the cell. So which way the cells are pointing to a genetic question, essentially. When do they express EMX2 or not? But it doesn't tell us how these cells coordinate with each other. And to understand how this happens, we need to look at what is called the notch signaling pathway. Okay, so this path, this pathway is a, a set of proteins that the cells use to talk to each other, and they do this in a, sort of a first neighbor uh, way. Okay, so these proteins, the cells, uh, the, these proteins are expressed on the surface of the cells, and the cells need to be in contact with each other, in physical contact with each other, so that they can, um, these proteins can interact and can relay signals to the nucleus. And the way that they do it is by expressing uh, what are called the notch receptors. So these are the proteins that give the, the pathway its name. Um, and delta, the, the corresponding ligands called delta. So when delta of one cell meets notch of a, a neighboring cell, there's a, um, there's a conformational change in the protein that makes that the, the internal part of notch, so there's a part of notch that is inside the cell, this part of notch gets uh, cut, so gets cleaved um, by, a, by an enzyme. And this part called the notch intracellular domain, or NICD for short, can then migrate to the nucleus, where it can activate or repress the production of many genes. And in particular, it activates its own production. So the, when you get NICD, you activate the production of notch, and it uh, and it inhibits the production of delta, okay? So having a lot of notch makes the cell produce less delta, okay? And this has consequences um, by, uh, for the way in which the cells uh, communicate with each other that I'm going to tell you about in a, in, in a second, okay? If they, they're not very obvious now, they, they'll become obvious when I show you um, equations. But first, let me um, tell you sort of a, a little bit uh, about how this uh, story started. So we realized that this um, pathway was involved in the setting of the polarity of the cells because we could use a, a chemical inhibitor called DAPT that what it does is that it prevents the, uh, it blocks the enzyme that cuts notch and sends the signal to the nucleus. So when you do this, the enzyme is blocked. So um, notch and delta meet, but there's no release of the notch intracellular domain to the nucleus. So the communication is essentially cut. The cells are, are uh, essentially uh, interacting with each other, but there's no signal sent to the, to the nucleus. And because there's no signal sent to the nucleus, there's no activation or inhibition of anything. So nothing can happen in the, in the cell. Um, well, it, what, sorry, what can happen is that um, the notch intracellular domain um, gets depleted, so you don't produce anymore because you're not um, cutting it, and then um, you produce, uh, then the cell becomes low on notch and it produces a lot of delta, okay? So that's essentially the, the idea of what would happen. Uh, and therefore, these cells that presumably will have low levels of notch intracellular domain, because nothing is being cleaved now, nothing is being cut and sent to the nucleus, if you treat the, the um, uh, the fish with this chemical inhibitor, what you see is that these cells now have a bias towards the rostral side. You get more of these cells that have a rostral uh, direction than cells of the coda direction, okay? So the idea here is, okay, you block the communication, you block the production of the notch intracellular domain, you get one polarity, okay? So now our rationale was, okay, what if we 
make a lot more of this notch intracellular domain. We should see the opposite, okay? The idea is low notch intracellular domain gives you one direction, high notch intracellular domain gives you the opposite direction. Uh, so what we did is we created um, a line of fish, a transgenic line of fish. That you, so you don't need to understand the details of this, but what this says essentially is that the hair cells and only the hair cells produce a lot of this notch intracellular domain that is tagged with a protein that then we can go and find, okay? Um, this protein is called MIC. Um, so essentially what you do is, is just turn a switch that turns on the production of, of NICD and the cell doesn't care about what notch is doing or what delta is doing or what anything else is doing. It's just stuck in this state in which it produces a lot of NICD, okay? And then we can go and look for this NICD by looking for this protein MIC, uh, which is plot here in, um, in cyan. So you see all these cells that express um, this extra NICD. And when you count <laughs> the polarity of the cells that produce NICD, you see that unexpectedly, so against what our intuition was telling us, these cells are also rostral polarized and they're even more rostral polarized than in the case of um, the, the DAPT uh, treatment, okay? So the, the idea here is, okay, we block the communication between the cells, we block the production of NICD and the cells are rostral polarized. And now we flood the cells with NICD and they're also rostral polarized and even more. So this was very confusing. We didn't understand what was happening. And this is um, sort of when I decided, okay, we need some modeling because it's clear that in this uh, system, which is a nonlinear feedback between the two cells, there might be things that are not so intuitive that are happening and we're just not seeing because we're thinking in this sort of simplified linear terms about our system. So I went and looked for uh, in the literature and the notch signaling pathway is a, a pathway that is relatively, um, so considering uh, the state of the art for most of, most of the signaling pathways uh, is um, where it, uh, it's been modeled in quite uh, a lot of detail. So I looked for um, some, some models of notch signaling and I adapted them for this situation in which you have these two cells interacting with each other, okay? So what these equations tells, uh, um, tell you is you have equations for uh, the concentration of notch, of delta, and the notch intracellular domain for cell one and cell two. And then you have this term uh, here, the, shaded, uh, the term shaded in blue represents the production of notch, uh, by the um, binding of notch intracellular domain, okay? So not, the notch intracellular domain activates the production of notch and inhibits the production of delta, okay? Then we have this term that is called um, cis uh, inhibition of notch and delta and is represented by this picture here. So it can happen that notch of one cell binds to delta of the same cell, but it's known that when this happens, both proteins get degraded, but there's no production of notch intracellular domain, okay? So this is just a loss term. So the, um, you just lose a molecule of notch and a molecule of delta, and you don't gain anything here for the notch intracellular domain. And then you have this term, which is the transactivation. It's called transactivation. So notch of one, of one cell binds to delta of the opposite cell, and this now creates a molecule of the notch intracellular domain. And then we assume that these molecules can all uh, degrade at a sort of a constant rate, okay? Um, so now uh, we can try to use this to understand uh, what happens in our system. So we can uh, use this first to get a simplified picture of this positive feedback between the cells. So essentially what happens is that this creates a winner takes all situation with a positive feedback in which if, if you start from random initial conditions where um, notch of two, both cells is close to zero, but you have fluctuations, the cell that has more notch will produce less delta and therefore will force the other cell to produce less notch because this cell won't be able to cleave because it, it doesn't have anyone, it doesn't have enough delta to cleave uh, against. So because it can't cleave, it doesn't, pro it doesn't release notch into our domain, so it can't produce notch and it produces more delta. And because it produces more delta, then this cell can cleave more of its notch and sort of repeat the, the, the cycle, okay? So this is a winner takes all situation in which the cell that 
because of the random fluctuations has a little bit more notch initially, it will suppress the other cell and it will win the competition. So this is what you see here and these time traces of a simulation of the, the equations that I showed you before. So the cells start with uh, very minimal amounts of notch. And then in this case, the blue cell, the cell number one, wins and goes to steady state and suppresses the production of notch in cell number two, while at the same time activating the production of delta in cell number two. And this sort of this get, um, leads to the release of a lot of notch in transcendental domain in cell one and none in cell two. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, yeah, what you have is that the cells can, in this way, um, you get a bistable steady state in which fluctuations will take you to a situation where cell one or cell two are high notch um, and, so, and vice versa. Uh, and this sort of polarizes the cells spontaneously in, in, these two, in these two states. And you can probably, you can already see how this can be used for the cells to make polarity decisions in a robust way, okay? So now if you have the level of NICD for cell one and cell two at the steady state, then the cells have an activation threshold if you're above the activation threshold, then you get one polarity. And if you're below the activation threshold, you get the opposite polarity. And at this point, uh, we don't know which polarity corresponds to, uh, so the model is degenerate in this case, we don't know if high notch corresponds to a rostral polarity or a colored polarity. But we can sort of backtrack and go back to the experiments. And we know, um, so we can look at what happens when we overexpress the notch intercellular domain. So in this case, this um, it's equivalent in our equations to add a, a source term to the production of um, the notch intercell intercellular domain. Um, so we add a constant term to the equations and we can sort of uh, look at the bifurcation diagram for what happens if we increase the rate of production. So what you see is obviously that the amount of notch intercellular domain increases for both cells. And what happens is that you, uh, for even small rates, you very soon move cell number two above the threshold, okay? And then you get even to a point where the visibility is completely destroyed and all the system is just dominated by this term and you just get both cells having high levels of uh, notch intercellular domain. But what it means is that very rapidly you go to a system in which the cells are flooded and both will have the same polarity. And we know from the experiments that the cells that overexpress uh, the notch intercellular domain are mostly rostral polarized. Okay, uh, so this would mean that a high amount of notch intercellular domain means a rostral polarity. Okay, so now we can go back and try to think what happens in the situation of um, the notch inhibitor. So why now, when we inhibit um, uh, the the cleavage of notch, um, why do we get this also this rostral bias? Okay, so what we have here is a bifurcation diagram in which I'm changing this. Um, um, the cleavage rate constant KT, okay? KT here, which is a, um, um, so the constant for the term that uh, describes the interaction of notch of cell one with delta of cell two and the production of the notch intracellular domain. So if we add this inhibitor, what it's effectively doing is lowering the value of KT. Okay, so lower values of KT means we have more of this inhibitor. And if we look at the bifurcation diagram, what happens is that for no inhibitor, so the wild type values of KT, we have this polarized uh, bistable steady state where cell one is high, cell two is low, or the opposite in which cell two is high, cell uh, one is low. But then when we increase the, um, uh, the amount of inhibitor or decrease the value of KT, there's this middle branch, this symmetric middle branch that appears in which both cells have the same amount of notch intercellular domain, but initially this branch is above the, um, the decision threshold. So this means that these two cells, although they have an intermediate value of NICD, this intermediate value is enough to put them in the rostral configuration. So this will give you an excess of rostered cells. And then, the model says that if you keep moving, so if you keep increasing the amount of inhibitor, you should reach a point where the, this middle branch is below and all your cells should be colored polarized. So at this point, when we had these results, uh, these theoretical results, uh, we couldn't increase the amount of the, this DAPT inhibitor in the cells because it 
uh, was little for the fish, okay? So we were sort of stuck in this area, and if we try to use more the APT, the cells will, the fish will die, and we would see no cells, so there's no bias. But the thing we realized is that we can go to this end of the, um, uh, of the diagram where there's no NICD, okay? And there's no notch at all. So this equation is, is zero, there's no notch, there's no NICD, so everything uh, is zero in the system. But this says that if you have zero NICD, you should have all the cells being um, codat polarized. And the way we could do this is by looking at notch mutants, okay? So these fish have the gene that produces a notch protein is mutated, so the protein is non-functional, non it's not there. So this sit right at this end of the bifurcation diagram. And what you can see is that all the cells point in the coda direction. And we can count these cells and see that like 100% of them, so this doesn't add up to 100% because there's some young cells that we can't score, but all the cells that we can see are all coded polarized. You don't see a single cell that is rostral polarized. Um, so this gave us sort of the idea that we were on the right track, but it would be nice if we could see sort of this transition going from an even number of cells to a, a rostral excess of cells to a, a coded excess of cells. So we um, uh, look uh, in the literature and we found that there is another inhibitor uh, of, the, uh, of this cleavage of notch and delta that is called LY44175 or LY for short, um, that, uh, that is, it has a much higher affinity and less side effects than uh, the APT. So we could try to use it to see if we can sort of uh, um, span a longer range of the bifurcation diagram. So we started by our controls. So these controls have only uh, this molecule called the MSO that is just a, um, a solvent. And when you start, so there's nothing there. So you see the wild type, you have 50% of cells uh, codat, 50% uh, rostrat. And then if you add a little bit of this LY uh, chemical, you see a rostrat bias. If you keep increasing the concentration, you see now that, that uh, the middle branch here is sort of at the level of um, the, uh, the decision threshold. So like random fluctuations will take you above or below with equal probability. So you see uh, an equal number of colon and rostrad cells. And if you increase it a bit more, then you flip the ratio and then you get cells that are colored polarized um, that have a, a colored bias, okay? So, um, and we can't go much further because, yeah, again, the, it starts becoming toxic. And just uh, for comparison, this is sort of the range where we think uh, the APT is in this middle range where uh, you get, uh, again, a, an excess of rostered cells like, it's hap uh, like hap it happens here. Um, so, uh, but in this way, we can sort of transverse the whole bifurcation diagram and uh, see where, um, and, and see this flip that we predicted uh, with the theory. So um, there was a, one more question that we wanted to answer, which is that this is very nice. I mean, it shows that Notch is involved in setting this, uh, this bias, but there's a question of whether this is really um, spontaneous in the sense that the cells initially are really equal and it's just random fluctuations that give you one fate or the other, or the other possibility is that there's something called asymmetric cell division that might happen in which one of the cells preferentially inherits something that makes it already different. And then this notch pathway is only amplifying those initial differences, okay? Um, so to test this, um, the hypothesis is that if you have asymmetric cell division, so the cells are already predestined to become either codad or rostrad, and you kill them at random, so you, randomly you kill one of them and you let the other one survive, what's going to happen is that you're going to have, because you don't know which cell you're killing, and this, so you can kill with equal probability either the rostrad or the colored cell, and what you would get is with equal probability, so 50-50% uh, of the surviving cell being colored or rostrad. Whereas if the division is symmetric, and this is just a purely dynamical process that is amplifying stochastic fluctuations, and that is, uh, yeah, and that, so, and it's a dynamical process that depends on the interaction between the cells, then 
if you kill one of the cells, the surviving cell doesn't have a partner to signal with. And because it doesn't have a partner, then it won't cleave any notch. Um, and because it doesn't cleave any notch, it will have a low level of notch and therefore will, with higher probability, acquire a codad state than a rostered state. Okay. And the other thing that this experiment would allow us to do is that if we kill the cells at um, uh, different times after the division, we can see how long do they need to be in, in interaction with each other to, um, to adopt a fate that you can't change, okay? So with uh, three very nice summer students uh, that I had last year, uh, we did this experiment. And um, uh, so what you're seeing in this movie is a newly formed cell here that is gonna go and divide. And then you'll see one of the two newly formed cells uh, disappear. So you see now it goes pop and it disappears. And now the same thing is gonna happen up here. So you're gonna see uh, another cell sort of dividing and then you see one of the cells disappear. And then now we can again move up and see the, um, the apical surfaces of the cells. And you're gonna see how this cell and this other cell here form their hair bundles. And the bundles will polarize and will point in a given direction. And what you see is after they're finished, is that both points, so this bundle and this bundle here, they're both colored polarized, okay? And these, we can do this systematically, repeat the, the experiment many, many times. And this again is a, a great work from uh, um, the, uh, my summer students, Ashley, um, Isabel, and, uh, and Isabella. Um, and you can see sort of that depending on how long do you wait, uh, to kill the cell, initially you get all the cells pointing in the color direction, and then you start getting more and more that point in the rostral direction, meaning, uh, so we can sort of count how many, so if you kill them within the first half an hour, 100% of them are going to be codat polarized, and then if you wait a little bit more, you go to a situation in which the decision has already been made, and now you have equal probability of killing a cell that is either rostral or codat, so this uh, probability goes down to 50%, okay? Which is sort of the, uh, as I explained before, is a situation in which the decision has already been made and you don't know which cell you're killing, so you kill them with equal probability. So in this way, what we show is that it takes sort of about half an hour to an hour for the cells to make this decision. Um, and if you kill the cells before that, the system always de uh, defaults to this sort of low notch state because you don't have a partner to signal with. So they go to this low notch state in which uh, they become uh, codat polarized. So um, let me go back now sort of to the beginning of the talk. I mentioned that there's this uh, transcription factor called EMX2 that is responsible for um, uh, the, the polarity of the cells. So what we see is that the, the notch intercellular domain inhibits the production of EMX2. So in the sense that you have high notch, you have low EMX2. Um, and therefore, this is what produces this uh, rostered bias. And in the sense that have no notch, no notch intracellular domain, you have a lot of EMX2, which produces the coded bias, okay? So this can, uh, and we know also that uh, if we look at the expression of delta, uh, we know that delta is expressed earlier in the cells than EMX2. So it seems like notch comes first, uh, and then it makes this um, uh, positive feedback between the two cells. It polarizes into a high notch state or low notch state, and then this directs EMX2 to be either high or low in um, the cells. So the idea here is that notch just inhibits EMX2. We can sort of write this in the form of equations. We can write sort of for we can do an adiabatic approximation. We don't need to write the dynamics of, of EMX2. We can just say, okay, EMX2 is just um, under the control of what NICD is doing. And a high NICD cell will be low in EMX2, uh, sort of low, low in EMX2. And this will make the cell being uh, called polarized. So this is all, um, seems all nice and fine, but there's a prediction of this model that says that now if I, if I upregulate the production of NICD, so if I overexpress NICD, but at the same time I overexpress EMX2, 
the cells should only care what happen, about what's happening with EMX2, okay? Because I'm just setting this, I'm setting a switch that floods the cell with EMX2. So what the NICD is doing, I don't care. So all the cells should have a lot of EMX2 and therefore they all should be coded polarized, okay? So because we want to make our lives, lives uh, hard, we went and did this experiment and we overexpressed NICD and EMX2 in both cells. And the expectation here was, okay, EMX2 is gonna dominate. All the cells are gonna be coded polarized. But what you see is that most of the cells are actually rostered polarized, which um, is sort of what is similar to what happens when you overexpress uh, NICD, okay? So this means that the, the, the situation is not as simple as not regulating EMX2 and that's it, but there's some other interaction that we, we are not aware of that is happening, okay? So after playing around with a lot of different uh, models, the more parsimonious explanation we could find is that NICD does not regulate EMX2 because this is something we see in the experiment, but then both NICD and EMX2 compete for the regulation of a, a yet unknown gene or set of genes, so something that is the actual polarity effector. This is what regulates the actual polarity of the cells, okay? So now if this gene is, has a high expression, then the cells will be uh, one polarity, and if it has a low expression, will be the opposite polarity, okay? And sort of these are the equations that we came up with uh, that uh, regulate the, the expression of this uh, putative gene. So uh, in this case, we chose the model is to generate on, on the signs of this, uh, the regulation by NICD or EMX2, they just need to be opposite. And what we decided here is to use a situation in which uh, EMX2 upregulates the production of uh, the polarity effector and uh, uh, NICD downregulates the uh, production of the polarity effector, okay? and they compete for this regulation. Uh, so now we can uh, simulate the, these equations and see what happens. So in the wild type, what we will have is, um, uh, we have the, uh, so this is the state diagram for the steady state concentrations of EMX2 and NICD. And I run uh, 100 simulations, changing the values of the parameters in the equations by 10% in each. So randomly by up to 10% um, in each. Um, so in the, in the case of the wild type, we have these cells that are low in NICD and high in EMX2. And because of that, they're above. So this is the, uh, the line of the polarity factor that if you're above, you are colored. If you're below, you're rostered. Okay. So this polar, this line we decided as being the half value of this P0 constant. Okay. That you can calculate this half value as being, so this is the shape of this line in the um, EMX2 NICD space, okay? Um, so these cells have a concentration that is higher than P0 over two, so they become colored polarized. These cells have high NICD and low EMX2, and they become rostered polarized. And these, in this way, so this is a wild type, there's so much to say here, you get 50% of the cells colored, 50% of the cells rostered, okay? But now, we can see what happens if we overexpress only EMX2. What happens is that you push these two states, you push them up, okay? You're just adding a constant to both state, uh, states and you push them up. So now most of the cells, the, regardless of what happens with NICD, most of the cells are high in EMX2. And therefore they're above. So EMX2 wins this uh, competition and activates the polarity factor uh, more than what NICD can inhibit, and then you're above the, um, the decision line and you become colored polarized, okay? If you do the same now and uh, activate NICD, uh, overactivate NICD, so all the cells become very high in NICD. NICD represses completely EMX2, so you have very, very low levels of EMX2, and therefore NICD represses the polarity factor and it, all the cells are below the line and then you have a roster bias, okay? And now what happens if we combine these two results and activate NICD and EMX2 at the same time? So what, what happens now is that you push the cells sort of diagonally uh, um, on, on the diagram. And now there's this competition where depending on whether the cells express a little bit more 
NICD, they will become Russell polarized. If they express a little bit more EMX2, they will become colored polarized. But there's this double inhibition of NICD to the polarity factor, okay? So NICD can inhibit the polarity factor directly, um, or it can inhibit the polarity factor production by inhibiting EMX2 and preventing it from activating the polarity factor. So more often than not, NICD wins and the cells have a tendency to be rostered polarized instead of colored polarized, okay? Uh, so just uh, to finish the talk, I want to connect a little bit with um, uh, the talk of Anna and tell you essentially where this um, story sort of lands to where uh, what Anna was uh, telling you um, in, in her talk. And is that this, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a, um, an unbiased mechanism that amplifies stochastic fluctuations and creates a, a robustly creates a cell that is colored polarized and a cell, a cell that is uh, rostered polarized. But this can happen in two possible configurations, okay? So you can go to a situation in which the colored polarized cell is to the left or the colored polarized cell is to the right. And in this case, if you look at the cells at the bundles, in this case, the bundles will be facing each other. In this case, the bundles will be facing away from each other, okay? But if you look at a, at a neural mass, you never see the situation in which the hair bundles look away from each other, okay? And this is because, uh, as Anna explained during her talk, these cells undergo this rearrangement. So if you see the cells dividing here, when they, in the wrong configuration where they would be looking away from each other, they, there's this uh, um, a coupling between the internal notch state of the cells and the direction in which they're gonna move that creates these rearrangements. So when the cells are trapped in the wrong configuration, these um, uh, polarity directed movements will make them flip and they will put them in the sort of right configuration that is the, the one that you uh, see always, uh, which is the one where the bundles are facing each other. And we see that these rearrangements happen 50% of the time, which agrees with the idea that this is, this is a completely unbiased mechanism um, and 50% of the time you get it wrong and then you need to rearrange the cells to get them in the, in the right configuration. Um, and these sort of just uh, to uh, summarize uh, and sort of connect with uh, what Anna uh, said in her talk is uh, that you have this biochemical step that gives you this um, sort of, sort of double well um, potential in which the cells can be either in the sort of positive or negative dipole but then there's this mechanical step that makes the negative dipole sort of flip and form a positive dipole. And sort of this consistently and robustly creates uh, this organization uh, of the neural mass. And with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, Jim, my mentor, uh, for all his support, Agnik uh, and Anna um, uh, for being great collaborators and all this work that we did in these two papers. Um, uh, that describes sort of first the biochemical step and then the, in detail the, the rearrangements. And Kim, who's the uh, grad student uh, who was in the lab that started sort of this project uh, with me. And uh, she uh, taught me all I know about uh, dealing with zebrafish and doing all these, uh, these imaging and uh, my funding uh, sources. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, very interesting talk. How mathematical <laughs> biology can help uh, explain uh, what is going on uh, with the very naive uh, predictions, right? Um, I invite uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, please, uh, you can directly connect uh, to the audio and to unmute your microphone and uh, ask question uh, directly. You can also uh, ask in the chat if you have any issues with your microphones. Uh, and okay, while someone comes up uh, with an idea, uh, I will have an, a question. Okay, um, you so just in the end of your talk, you discuss this idea that there is a putative uh, uh, intermediate step, uh, right? Uh, with the putative gene, that there is a, a intermediate step. Um, which determines if uh, EMX uh, or uh, uh, NICD would uh, 
uh, dominate and uh, lead yeah. to the determination of the final polarity. So uh, my question is, uh, so this putative gene is comes up uh, to fix uh, this uh, uh, prediction that uh, follows from uh, a less elaborate model. Yeah. But uh, have you thought of any alternative? So if it's not a putative uh, gene, right? Uh, what would be, so if putative uh, gene is hypothesis zero, then what would be the hypothesis uh, one? That it I mean, is not? There's, a, uh, there's a possibility that there is some complicated interaction just between NICD and EMX2 uh, that we don't understand. I'm I'm a bit sort of uh, hesitant to think that's the case. So I try a lot of different models where you don't assume any other variables and it's very hard to reproduce. It's, uh, you need to do like very contrived things or adjust the parameters in very narrow uh, ranges to get um, all these results, to be able to reproduce all the results that we know. So what happens when you, uh, when you have a wild type, when you overexpress one of the genes, the other gene, when you do chemical chemical inhibition and things like that. So it always breaks down at some point if you don't assume that there's uh, something else. Um, oh, but you, what you're saying there is in this uh, dia uh, in the um, diagram of the uh, parameter space, uh, there are uh, ranges of parameters that would uh, reproduce your original uh, prediction. The, yes, yeah. So if you assume like some interactions between EMX2 and NICD, you can find some terms uh, in the equations and like some ranges of parameters where you can see it, but they're not very robust. So, so the problem is that they will work for like finely tuned parameters, but when you try to do something like what I'm doing here, which is like you just do a robustness analysis and just just vary the um, the uh, the parameters by let's say 10% or or something like that, uh, you allow them to vary and just to random simulations uh, with the parameters, um, you is you can't reproduce all the um, the proportions the of cells that you see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. All right. And uh, well, uh, and so suppose the uh, so the, 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 that alternative model would uh, introduce some new uh, interaction between NICD or NDMX two. But what uh, other ideas, other, any other ideas except uh, these two, just in case you thought of anything? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, that's, I would say the most obvious is either there's some interaction between the genes themselves that mm -hmm. form the, the sort of the, the regulation, the regulatory motif, or there's okay. some extra genes that we, that we don't know. Yeah, that would be sort of the more parsimonious explanations I can I can think of yeah okay um, thank you uh, let me then uh, uh, ask a question from the audience so Luciana Bruno asks uh, so she tells that uh, it was a very nice talk uh, thank you uh, so the question does the lateral inhibition occurs between pairs of cells or it can be involved uh, more than it or it can involve more than two neighboring cells um, so we think it all involves the these two cells because the the cells. Um, let me show you a little bit. Uh, maybe we can. Um, so if you see for in the movie, uh, in the in the initial movie that I show how the 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 cells um, sort of appear, they sort of the cells are created in pairs, and these pairs are. Um, sort of, they appear in different parts of the of the neural mass. Uh, so there's never like two pairs of young cells that are uh, uh, close to each other, and it's only these cells when they're in this immature state that express the uh, proteins of the notch pathway. Okay, so if you look at, for example, um, the expression of of uh, delta, which is one of the few that we can see. So this is uh, sort of kind of problematic to see these proteins, uh, but uh, delta we, we can sort of see uh, in a snapshot. And when you look at it, it only appears in these immature cells. Let me see if I, I think I have a picture here where we uh, quantify these. Um, 
so I can show you. Yes. Um, so these are uh, two young cells. And you see that these are sort of expressing delta. There's a little bit more delta in these cells that are um, a little bit older, but they're sort of becoming already um, uh, uh, mature and they're downregulating delta. And then you don't see it anymore. So, so we think that there's like this, this pulse of signaling that happens when the cells are young. And because these divisions are sort of sparse and spread out, they only interact with each other. And then the other thing is that they seem to move. So they, this organ is three-dimensional and the cells seem to move sort of down first to do this interaction and then move up again. And we think that they do this also to avoid crosstalk with other cells. Uh, so we are pretty certain that this is just uh, um, at like uh, only two cells interacting with each other. All right, thank you. I hope this, um, uh, this clarifies. Yeah, so uh, the author of the question uh, agrees <laughs> that it clarifies the question. Um, are there someone else in the audience? No. I've seen I ask one. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, so can you go back to the face diagram at the, of the model lateral inhibition? Uh, yes. So if I understand, there's a there's a subcritical pitchfork here, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, and I understand it's not easy to do the experiment, but just to make clear, so you moved away from the from the bifurcation point. Is there any chance you could do an experiment where you see the the bifurcation itself, for example, by hysteretic effects? You go up, and then you show that the system has hysteresis. Um, it's, it's quite hard. Yeah, these experiments are um, uh, because you add a chemical inhibitor, so this sort of disrupts the fish. Um, so, uh, I mean, one could, I guess, I, yeah, I could think sort of a, of a way maybe you can add, count the cells, and then if you're lucky to be able to keep the fish alive after you count the cells, uh, reduce the amount, and then see it again. It would be, it would be quite hard, but I guess it's, it's an interesting question because uh, depending on also on the parameters of the model, the pitfall could be subcritical or supercritical. And there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing to say um, that it needs to be one way or the other. And mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe we need better tools to, um, to do it. I think we, with the way that we do the experiments right now it would be very hard to see because the experiments are very noisy. You see that the differences, uh, they're not super high also. Yes. And you need to, uh, and to get sort of down to these differences, you need to count a lot of cells. Well, um, but I would, I would kick the system up to the, to, the, to the upper branch, for example, and then the differences will be high, right? Yes, yeah, so you could, um, well, but that's, so that's the, the thing. So it's hard that's to That's the kick, hard part. Yeah, that's the hard part because it, you, I mean, this, uh, for example, here, when, when you go to this part, um, yeah. presumably there should be a, a, a range that you should be able to reach with a chemical inhibitor where you see uh, all the cells uh, of the same polarity, but the system is very noisy in itself. And mm -hmm. when you add, it's not super clear to me also that all the cells see the same concentration or react in the same way mm -hmm. to the concentration. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing sort of uh, in the experiments is uh, either a combination of a lot of these bifurcation diagrams with slightly different parameters for each mm -hmm. of each pair of cells mm -hmm. or some dynamical noise also that we don't understand. So mm -hmm. it's, I, I, I think it's, it's a really uh, great question. I, and I thought about it a lot and I'm not super sure. I think it would, the experiments will require a lot of time and a lot of effort to do. And I'm not entirely sure we will see the answer we That's want it. at the end. And if we don't see it, I'm not sure we can conclude anything because okay. the noise, uh, we don't have a lot of control on the noise of the, uh, on the system. So we don't know where is it coming from and why it's obscuring the, the results. Yeah. Understood, thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, all right. Uh, I actually seen that uh, other, some other people in the audience tried to connect the microphone. So if you are still around,
Yeah, there, there's a question from uh, Valeria also. If oh, all right. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so the question from Valeria, great talk. Uh, uh, could support cells uh, have a role in this polarity decision? Yes. Um, so we, yeah, we think they don't um, because again, the, the support cells, the, the support cells do use the notch pathway at some point. Um, uh, because this is the pathway that they use to decide whether they're going to become hair cells or um, support cells. Um, so there's a possibility that there is some crosstalk there, uh, but the expression of notch in the support cells is, um, it seems to be biased in certain, so they, they express more notch in certain parts of the neural mass than others. And we never see a bias of the, um, uh, of the polarity depending on where the hair cells um, appear, okay? So that seems to suggest that the, the hair cells are doing their own thing and they're not talking to the supporting cells. Um, and we think they do this again, as I was saying before, because they move uh, sort of down in the organ, they move more basally in the organ, they do this uh, communication during a short period of time and then they move up. And what we think it might be happening is that there, that there is, um, some spatial compartmentalization of the signal so that the support cells are talking sort of on the apical uh, part of the organ and the hair cells talk more basally. And, uh, and then this is the way they avoid the interaction. Or the other possibility is that they are using different variants of the notch proteins to do this or, and the delta ligands, okay? That uh, let's say the hair cells use notch one and the support cells use notch three and this, in this way they avoid um, the interaction. So, Every so all the evidence we have, which is not a lot, seems to suggest that the hair cells do this in isolation. Uh, but I I couldn't sort of completely discard that the support cells don't have a role. And this is something I want to study in the future, but we don't have um, the right tools to do it right now. Um, so this is something I'm working on to to try to get at. You are muted, Roman. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Valeria. Yes, and um, um, we we may also we may still answer any other questions if there are. Well, all right. Um, I think that yeah, we we already over there. <laughs>